Okay, we're back. We're live doing one of my favorite things in the world. That is the military in Hawaii. And today we're talking about Aloha Spark. And you're going to be interested to find out what they do and who they are and, and how they handle things you don't really expect. So this is really an important thing. So we have a pilot among us. It's the Nico Sonic Botipa. Botipka. Bo, Bo yeah, I get that right. Uh, awesome. Welcome to the show, Sonic. Nice to see your smiling face. You know, and I was always, I always felt that pilots, pilots were different. They're different. Like <laughs> Top Gun, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, the truth of it is we are different. We're all uh, giant nerds and um, pilots don't want to admit that, but it, it's, it's the truth. Uh, they're a bunch of really nerdy dudes uh, uh, who fly planes with Air Force, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> and Anthony Collyhoff, Kali I get that right? Uh, call um, off, like you're calling okay yep. and uh tell us tell us uh you both of you guys are officers you're both here stationed in hawaii part of the air force and um tell us tell us about aloha spark actually Anthony. um well so sonic is best suited for aloha spark we work really closely together i'm here on behalf of tron which is a, sort of like a subset of Aloha spark if aloha spark is all of innovation tron really focuses on software and how we can use that solution set to solve problems. Yeah, so he called himself a geek, but you, you're more of a geek than that, aren't you? You would think, and then the pilots show up and start putting you to shame, so <laughs> you try to keep up. Yeah. You know, so, when you're in love, the whole world is a geek, I tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the most wonderful thing. I, we know about this at Think Tech, right? You can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so the Air Force, um, you know, you start out with the notion is that the Air Force, like every other military service these days, there's a lot of really high caliber people there. Um, not only the graduates of the academies, um, you know, but the OCS and, and who knows how, how they got to be an officer. Um, and, and the question is, um, you know, innovation. We need innovation. American industry, and for that matter, everything in America needs innovation. You guys are the innovation mongers. So why do you have to be separated? Shouldn't there be innovation everywhere, in every command, in every unit? Why do you have to be separated as a separate organization? Uh, Sonic, try that one. Yeah, that, so that's an excellent question. And uh, I, I don't necessarily think that we have to be separated, right? Um, but what always happens is... Um, the priority is the mission first. And unless you take some subset of uh, your, your manpower, set them to the side and say, uh, you people focus exclusively on innovation and bring in an agile mindset to our airmen to make our kill chains more flexible, you people will do it. Unless commanders uh, in the uh, military sense or uh, in the private sector, unless the, the managers or the CEOs up at the C-suite deliberately do that, then what happens with innovation is a lot of times it just it gets brushed under the rug. It is a lower priority for everyone because it's not their main job. Uh, and so what we've done at 15th Wing, what our my, my boss has done, Colonel Dobbles, is uh, a really fantastic job where he has uh, laid us out to the side and said, you will focus on innovation because it's a priority for us. Okay. Well, that's, that's all reasonable. Um, and sometimes it, uh, it's a question to me anyway about the chain of command. Um, mm -hmm. Short story. When I was in the Coast Guard, there was a ship that was involved, a Coast Guard ship that was involved in a, a really tragic um, failed rescue. And uh, I was a lawyer and, and me and my typewriter and my, and my, and my suitcase, um, they flew me out to this Coast Guard ship, it was off the East Coast. And uh, I, I, uh, I told the Admiral, I, rather the, the captain of the ship, I told him, you have, you have to go to whatever I said, Yorktown right now for the investigation. And he said, well, you can't tell me what to do. I get my instructions from the, the district. And I said, you know, look at this letter. This gives me operational control of your ship. Guy almost felt he fainted. Uh, what? This young lieutenant had operational control of my ship, tells me where to go. It was incredible. But it was, you know, necessary, I suppose. Point is that the chain of command, people are pretty jealous about their command prerogatives, you know, you see that all the time in every service. So when you walk in to the captain of the ship or the, the aircraft or the base and say, look, we have some ideas for you. How, how does that 
how does that person feel about having an outsider come in and tell him what to do? Uh, so that that is a that is a wonderful question. And uh, Jay, like, I mean, the answer is obviously you're you're asking a question about like human interaction. Obviously, the question is varied, right? So number one, about command structure, uh, I work for uh, the 15th Wing Commander, and I operate at his prerogative. Um, and the military command structure, even with innovation, is completely intact, and it's something that uh, the military cannot operate without. Um, on, on the other hand, um, when I, I feel like you're broaching the subject of how do we approach someone and ask them to uh, develop an innovative idea. Exactly. And, and they, that, that question runs the gamut, right? Uh, there are, there are you know, many commanders out there who are extremely supportive. Um, or like, and you're like, hey, sir, you know, this air, sir, ma'am, this airman had this great idea. I want to let you know this is what's going on. Can we run with it? Um, you know, a lot of commanders out there are like absolutely 100% go for it. And that's completely to be expected. Other ones have actual operational constraints that they just, that, that are difficult for them to still accomplish their mission and support innovation. Because what we talked about a little bit earlier, right? Our manpower is a finite resource in the Air Force. And if I'm coming up to you and saying, sir, I really need you to, uh, giving me this airman to, um, you know, so I can work with him for 20 hours a week to get this project done. He may have very realistic, real world constraints and, and not be able to allow that to happen. Right. Uh, and so the, the, the response is, is completely varied depending on, on who exactly we talk to. Well, you have to have good social skills to do this work. I mean, I don't know if I have good social skills. I'm sure great social skills uh, would absolutely help. Um, but yeah, I, I, I try and, and do the best I can to, do, to be friendly and likable, and obviously uh, convince them to, to put their resources in innovation. How about Anthony over here? Does he have good yeah. social skills? Huh? Yes. Oh, well, I said, I said yes beforehand, <laughs> anticipating a different question, but we'll take it. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to throw in that most of the time when we're interacting and bringing up ideas for innovation, we don't have to do a lot of pushing. It's uh, more of pulling us along. And the pain point exists for the organization and innovation is how do you go about solving that? So it's not often that we come in and just say, you got to be doing things differently. It's usually like, this thing has been driving us crazy for a while, but there's all these different factors at play. How do we come up with a solution? And as experts in innovation who've gone through the training on that, we can teach the models that we know that lead to a better solution. And, and, and Jay, what Anthony said is such a great point, right? It's, it's not that we walk into units and say, you must do this better, right? Like in order for any successful like innovation, we can just, just talk about the products that we bring to squadrons as just being a new startup out in, the, out in the free market, right? Like people have to want to buy that and people have to want to change their daily habits to align with, with whatever new product we have for them. In this case, it may be a new software solution coming from Anthony's team or it may be a 3D printed thing or a different process coming from my team. Um, both of those are completely fine, but we have to convince them to um, change the way they do things now and swap over to another set. And usually those problems are self-identified. They're like, this is really painful. Let's involve Aloha Spark and Tron and, and see exactly what we can do to fix it. Um, you know, this, design, this reminds me of design thinking out of Stanford, which is a, a whole... You no know, way of way of thinking, I think it. And it's like uh, when you have the skills, when you have the technology, and you walk into somebody who might be your client, say, whatever the context is, your client, um, and he tells you what he wants. And then you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't really want that. Let me explain what you really want, because I am trained to listen <laughs> to exactly what, what is at the core of your need. And design thinking helps you do that kind of interaction so that you come up with the assignment that really gets home on it rather than the assignment that the, in this case, the commander feels is necessary. You go through the kind of process? I think it's a balance that you have to walk. You want to help find a better solution than anybody could come up with independently, but you also don't want to invalidate the people who are experiencing the problem. Uh, and a lot of times, historically, uh, we have people working on solutions that aren't intimately familiar with what's actually happening. And so they make assumptions or they work off requirements that didn't match the service member's actual needs. 
And then we end up with something that's kind of diverted. So you walk a line of de design thinking, helping people come to better solutions, as well as taking what they're saying to you at face value and working to solve that. You guys, you guys volunteer for this unit? Or, or, was it, or is it something? Well, I mean, in the Coast Guard, we had something called a wish list. You have that in the Air Force? And was this on your wish list? Uh, I, will, I will tell you how I got involved in innovation. Uh, and then Anthony can talk about, about his path. This is not a typical uh, job move in the Air Force. Um, no, I still it doesn't sound like that at all. Yeah, I, I still don't know if it's like traditionally good for your career or not. I happen to love what I do, so I'm just going to stick around doing it. Um, Aloha Spartans. But when you tell them that you appeared on Think Tech Hawaii, your I mean, career will be insured. I, right, I, up, right up the flag, I'm telling you now. I am very excited. Very excited for that. I can't wait to be promoted to 05 uh, <laughs> off the show. Um, the Aloha Spark used to be a one-woman show for a while. Uh, the, her, my predecessor, uh, Major Susan Weeks, she was the only person running it, and she just looked like she was drowning. And I'm like, hey, can I help out? That's how I get, got involved. It was literally that simple. I was in the right place in the right time, saw her stressed out, uh, and wanted to jump on board. Um, and then we've just been growing ever since. So it's been, it's been pretty exciting. And yeah, I literally just asked for it. Um, and I wasn't sent here to Hawaii specifically for this. But while I was here, I was like, hey, guys, while I'm here, I'd like to work on this. Yeah, so you, you've had the ability to innovate for your own selves, to grow, to grow the unit. Am I right, Anthony? I mean, what, what's your story about how you got involved? Yeah, so I took the squeaky wheel approach and uh, I kept saying we could do better until I, I fell into this new opening. Uh, Tron has only been around for a couple of years. And uh, while we were going through the software process, we figured out we needed somebody like me as a cyber officer to sign off on some security requirements. So they heard my name, uh, you know, my hunger to solve problems. And uh, I ended up here. And I think a lot of us just see how much better we could be doing in certain areas and keep fighting for a better solution. And then we end up in organizations like this. Well, so how far do you ride, do you ride the baby, so to speak? In other words, you, you evaluate the request or the problem, whatever it might be, and you come up with some conceptual you know, program, some idea uh, to solve the problem. Um, and then who actually executes the idea? I guess it depends on the case, doesn't it? But can you, can you tell me what, you know, what the, the experience you have is? I mean, do, do, you, do you write it right down to the last inch or maybe uh, stop at some point and let them do it? What a phenomenal question. There is so much packed into this question. Number one, there is no standard stereotypical route for uh, the way a project starts from idea to completion, right? We intercept projects from the very beginning of an idea. Sometimes it's not even an idea. Sometimes it's people just griping about issues that they have at work. Um, sometimes we pick up a project like halfway through completion, right? Sometimes we pick up a project from another base and we're like, we want to do it here. Um, but in all cases, every single project is different because um, there is not one path to success. We don't just like bring the team in and be like, all right, let's innovate this together and like snap our fingers, magic happens and the solution pops out, right? We have to talk about money. We have to talk about the best approach. We have to talk how, about how many people we need involved, about how many iterations we need. And so really when, when, I, when I brief this, I have a uh, kind of a Venn diagram that has Aloha Spark, Tron right next to it, some overlap because there are lots of projects out there that involve some hardware components, some CPI component along with uh, Anthony's software component. And then there are just lines popping out from it and all the different pathways we have to success, whether it's through something called the SIVR program, the SITR program, whether it's uh, through Ensign doing hacking for defense or X-Force or one of their capstone projects to just a CPI event to um, just project coaching. There is just a myriad of different ways. So there is not a typical answer. We will find any way to take a project from here and get it to completion. And we work on it for as long as people are willing to work on it. You're you collaborating. You're collaborating, and uh, and I got it about Anthony does software, but uh, what does Aloha Spark do, and and how does Aloha Spark co collaborate with the software guys? Uh, well, technically, the technically they work for me, so um, collaboration is very easy, um, <laughs> right? I'm not making notes on this. <laughs> um, the so Aloha Spark does anything not software related. We and. 
we don't develop our own software. We will work with outside companies that have software. If, if Tron doesn't have the uh, capacity to uh, develop a specific amount of code for us, um, but we do a lot of added manufacturing. We do things like uh, virtual reality training. We do CPI. We do just straight up project coaching. We will take an idea, find the appropriate software company and or source Tron to help work on it with us. Um, and then we do a lot of the outside projects like hacking toward a fence. We will run those projects, even if there is a software base. So we do everything except the straight up um, coding of software. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about what about it, Anthony? I mean, do you take it down to the last inch, or do you come up with uh, some some kind of program and uh, hand it off? I think our most exciting work is really down to the last inch, to the the ones and zeros on the code, and figuring out how to make it happen. We do do a lot of other stuff as well, things that we call accelerator projects. So we're just helping people find new ways to do what they're doing, but. What made us different from just a spark cell is we have developers, we have user experience designers and project managers that take really good ideas and then turn them into working applications that the warfighter uses. And so that's what happened with our biggest application, Puffboard, which is a collaborative live flight scheduling software. We had an idea, we worked through the authorization process and now it's in use at over 150 squadrons. That's, well, that's really a great exciting. success. It's not limited to Hawaii. Yeah. It's not. It, it's spreading out and encompassing more mission sets and diving deeper into the ones that we're already in to take on more and more of the pain points that the schedulers face. Well, you've drawn a, a very you know, expansive view of the the possibility of problems and and uh you know as an outsider it strikes me that you know the the military has a lot of problems that are um at the, first of all it changes that's the first thing <laughs> it's not like it's static in any way so you you know you could solve a problem today and a week later there's another one that you never you know ever heard of until a week later but the other thing is um you, you're you're in a kind of a um, a pressure situation. I mean, for example, for example, uh, I would imagine that your that your organization had something to do with COVID uh, over the past year. That people came to you and said, "Look, we want to protect the Air Force and the and the, the airmen and women, you know, from COVID. But give us some systems that where we can make sure that it's all working correctly and that we get the maximum, you know, protection and, for that matter, the maximum." vaccination and whatever whatever is necessary have you had projects around covid yes we have so one of the most exciting projects that we've had goes to show how much we've grown since we first started with puckboard it took a year to get to production figuring out all the different technological and bureaucratic blockers but with stoplight our covid application we were able to deploy something in a week uh, what Stoplight did is took people who were manning entry control points at the medical groups and uh, giving out basically flyers saying, you know, have you been in contact with anyone with COVID? Do you have any symptoms? And then once they're all good, they let them through. That's a really routine process, perfect for software. So we were able to make a simple web app that doesn't require uh, the storing of any personal identification information and put that up in a week so that instead of a person standing there, it's just a sign. It has a QR code and you go through the checklist and you're good to go. And that goes to show that we're not just coming up with something new and sticking with it. We understand that we're always gonna be coming up with something new and how do we respond to new things quicker and more effectively? Stoplight's a great example of that. It must be very stimulating to be able to do that, to have the you know, the, the freedom, the latitude to do that and to have the gratification of knowing that your ideas have worked here, done what you wanted, and that they have been, you know, um, used by people elsewhere. That's, that's a kick. Absolutely. Um, what, you guys have mentioned the, the whole thing about hacking, okay? Big issue in the news today, very important, and certainly it, it affects the military in the sense that we really cannot afford to have hack, hacking on our, on our federal government or our military. Um, have you had projects along those lines? And um, you know, what is what is that issue like today? How 
much of a priority is it? I think we're in a good position there. What has been a challenge in the past is having to factor in security and defenses against hacking while wanting to incorporate new features and respond to the ever-changing world. So what we did in response to that is build out an architecture that allows us to combine modern practices of DevOps, so that's combining development and operations with the security that the government needs to operate at. We call it DevSecOps, and we follow the Air Force's chief software officer's DevSecOps reference architecture with all the software we deploy. So that's just a lot of words to say that every step along the process has security baked in and it's automated. So when we do new features, we know via our tools that it's going to be secure and we can rest easy at night. Ah, Jay, Jay I, I, I can't. You, yes, Sonic, I want to hear your thoughts on this. I, I can't overstate this. Like the tactical advantage uh, and the strategic advantage that Tron brings to the battlefield is like, when they write a program, yes, it sounds easy to just deploy something on the app store. It is not that case when you're working with the military. Our cybersecurity is the bedrock of what allows us to have a competitive edge over China and the Pacific, right? And so our cybersecurity has to be tight. And so the fact that Tron Hawaii can literally put a program out in a week and update it whenever they need to under these, these really stringent software requirements is absolutely incredible. And it is a it is an ability that the Air Force has never had before. And these new software factories, you know, sprouting up, Tron Hawaii, obviously being my favorite and being the only operationally focused software factory in the Air Force, um, they are redefining the way that we are able to iterate and be agile uh, in a 21st century fight. Uh, it is so important what they do. And like, I can't overstate this to anyone who doesn't have any software development. This is a complete game changer what Tron does. Thinking about game changes, I wonder if you have a reaction to what happened with, uh, was it the um, Colonial Pipeline hack recently? Colonial Pipeline was the object, although the, the government didn't admit that immediately, was the object of a ransomware attack. Um, and ransomware, according to 60 Minutes, is something you know that you can get on a website um, organized in Russia real easy. And you don't have to code one line of code. You can do it on drag and drop with this website. Anyway, so, you know, big question is how do you stop this sort of thing? And until now, I haven't heard of anything where you, you know, you shrug your shoulders, but um, there's no, no way to stop it. Well, the FBI, if you saw this uh, last week, they were able to recover about half of the Bitcoin payment. Okay. And how did they do that? It's, 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 it's out of a, it's out of a serial on TV. It's out of a cable movie. I tell you, how did they do that? Well, they worked with the people who were about to pay the ransom. And somehow they were able to track the ransom. This is out of a movie. And so they didn't get it all back. I think it was $5 million altogether, but they, they got half of it because they, were, they stepped into the line of payment somehow. I don't know how. And it seems to me that you know, with some creative juice on this sort of thing, um, we can even... We can even solve that problem. Good for the FBI that they figured out how to get it back. Nobody ha had done that up to that point, except maybe you guys, I don't know. Uh, but it just shows you that there's this opportunity for innovation, even in something that doesn't look like this opportunity for innovation. Thoughts? I've got a yeah, lot. Got Anthony, <laughs> as a cyber officer, once again, go ahead, brother. Yeah. I well, I'll say as a cyber officer, I think that's a little outside of my scope. Um, but, you know, drilling into the, the thought that you had there, there is definitely room for innovation pretty much in every aspect of the military. And it's something that, and the government, that we are embracing more and more. And I'm so excited to see the, the leadership and uh, the workforce buy into it. And I think that it's going to produce outcomes that we never imagined. Yeah, well, that happened here. So one thing that strikes me, a couple of thoughts, and I like your, your view of this, uh, is number one is, um, uh, although you don't find this so much in the civilian community, the military community find a lot of training. They find training. You know, when I was in the service and my observation of people in the service over the years since is they do get trained. 
there are there are classes about this that and the other thing before you know it you have a phd and you haven't and you, ha you haven't you know you, you you had to have the phd because that's the way it got set up and likewise um you know we talked before about the changes and the and the new things happening and you guys have to be at the cutting edge because you have to know more than your clients of how to solve problems you have to bring to the table more than just um, you know an innovative spirit you have to have you have to have knowledge <laughs> you have to have technique you have to have resources about how to solve problems so my question is uh when anthony or any of the other staff around you sonic um you know uh, goes through their daily or weekly or annual experience you must have plenty of training for them because they have to be up current on everything that's available right i mean honestly like okay should we devote our resources to trying to make sure that every single airman knows all the latest technology and the, all the latest like theories on how to solve problems I don't think so. I think that is a losing ball game where the net, you know, because of the explosion of information and the global interconnectedness is, is just getting wider and wider and wider. What we need, and this goes directly to uh, what Anthony was talking about a little bit ago, is we need airmen who are comfortable innovating. We need airmen who have an agile mindset, who when a problem is put forward in front of them, is be like, all right, no big deal. We're going to sidestep around this and we're going to, and we're going to keep going, right? That builds flexible kill chain. That makes it so um, whatever uh, effects we need on target will actually happen because our airmen are used to doing that. And there are several ways we do that. Um, I want to highlight one of the programs that, that Anthony's, Anthony's team is pushing so aggressively, and it's the SDI, the Software Development Immersive, right? You talk about this ransomware attack. That is bad, right? And what the military needs is they need airmen and soldiers and Marines who have software fluency, who have a cybersecurity fluency, right? And so one thing the Air Force is, is investing heavily on, which Anthony's team is, is spearing, is, the, is this in education, this immersive education on software development. And we can find the airmen who have that natural knack, just like you said, who want to know more than everyone else, who stay up late and are on, you know, Think Tech Hawaii's uh, webcast, you know, just, just watching the old episodes and have that passion. We need them to be working for the Air Force in a software capacity or in an innovation capacity in order to stay ahead of the competition. The way we do that is we find passionate people, give them an agile mindset, and then put them in a position where they can make decisions. And that's what we're trying to do here. What's an agile mindset? An agile mindset, so number one. Uh, so agile mindset to me, everything's focused on the customer and we iterate, 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 iterate until funding stops or people are done, right? Mm -hmm. Like we test it. It, did it work? No. Okay. Test it again. You know, we test cheap and fast. And it's, it's this startup mentality, this lean thinking mentality. That's what I think when I, when I talk about an agile mindset, I want airmen who are faced with a problem. Like, all right, let's try something else. Develop five minutes of a solution. If it worked good, we're going to keep building on it. And obviously that's what uh, agile software development does. And that's what Anthony's team does. Yeah, that's what Thomas Edison did. <laughs> that's excellent. You know, it is that finding out what doesn't work. Yeah, uh, that can be more powerful than a correct assumption because it it more narrowly confines your ideas of the world. It's science, isn't it? That's <laughs> what it, it is. is. <laughs> That's what Agile has a lot of basis in science and doing the scientific method, taking your assumptions and then testing them in the real world. And it's, well, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's very useful for any military um, command organization to have this kind of um resource available to it and uh, i was um, you know i was wondering i asked you beforehand uh, whether uh, other services have adopted the same approach or not or uh, whether other services have alternatives that go to the same place uh is this happening i mean if it if, if it's if it's happening in the air force it should be happening elsewhere don't you think every service has some sort of innovation component to it um I'm obviously biased, and I don't want to speak necessarily to specifics about what the other services do. Um, I will just say that the Air Force does it the best. Uh, I'm very proud of what we do. I'm very proud of AFWorks um, and the, the effort that they've pushed forward um, and the fact that operational units across the Air Force have their own spark cells who focus solely on innovation. The other thing that I'm proud of is Tron Hawaii, who is 
uh, that right now they are expanding, right? They are the first software factory that was part of an operational wing that is out there to solve wing problems and not Air Force level problems or big problems. It is, I'm going to solve wing problems. And it's, it's this grassroots theory. And Tron Hawaii is now expanding and filling out Tron nodes across the entire DOD. Uh, and the Air Force is very focused on this uh, grassroots up, uh, enable airmen across the Air Force from the lowest level, and let's see what happens. That's the way the Air Force is approaching it, and I'm a huge fan of it. Well, it uh, sounds like it's not only internal, internal systems, internal problems, but also external, <laughs> because uh, you can, you know, you can take data and make something of it. You can figure out solutions that have a geopolitical effect or intelligence effect, and uh, that's that's got to be part of it. So, Anthony, uh, we're almost out of time here, and I want to ask you one more question, and that is this: I mean, this is there's so there's such a vitality in you guys. I'm so impressed, actually. Um, you know, is is this a is this a good job for somebody outside the Air Force to think about getting into? Um, if I if I have a little experience, if I'm excited about software and programming and what have you, problem solving, is this something where I could I could I could get into I could get into Tron um, and have what you have? How do I do that? I think if you're a person who is excited about solving problems and you want to contribute to the United States, then more than ever, the military and the US government are looking at ways to incorporate your contributions and work hand in hand. In the past, we've had a hard time translating commercial victories into government victories because of the processes that were separating us. But with programs like the Small Business Innovation Resource, uh, the SBIR, uh, and AFWorks and innovations efforts in general, we're focused on both fields, private and public, working together to, to push what the US is capable of and how we can serve uh, the citizens in new ways. So work with companies that are working with the military or with the government and look for new ways to push them and to push us and we'll both achieve new heights. Yeah, Jay, get, yeah, go ahead. All right, this is so important to me. It's, 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 it's this thing right here, the how do people get involved? Number one, to your point, Jay, if you'd like to join uh, the Air Force or you'd like to join an organization like Tron uh, and you are, you, are, you are committed to the United States is a huge life decision. Um, yes, please do. If that's not your cup of tea, that is okay. We, the Air Force works with small businesses across the globe, uh, across the Air United States uh, on the daily basis, right? Go to lowhousepark.com, get in touch with me if you want to hear about things like the Small Business Innovation Research Grant or the STTR, which is a public-private uh, partnership. You can have an impact in the security of the United States and working with uh, the greatest men and women in the world, the men and women in the United States military, uh, even if you don't want to join the military. Uh, you can help us close the, the, the gap, the technology gap between the private sector uh, and the Department of Defense and the federal government. You can help us do that, and you can do it from the comfort of your own home with your own business uh, and still have a, have a pretty healthy profit margin, right? There are business opportunities out there, and we are out here to prove to the world that the United States Air Force is not anti-business, and we are a great investment for people who are on the leading edge of technology and innovation to come work with us. You mentioned uh, they could get in touch with you. Um, how do they do that? You want to give us your Aloha Spark website or someplace? Yeah, absolutely. AlohaSpark.com. Uh, our contact's information on there. Uh, I love talking to people, um, no matter who you are, even if you just want to chat uh, about what I believe about innovation, like just give me a call, um, send me an email. Uh, yeah, go on there. And I'd love to have the conversation, especially with, with companies in Hawaii. Thank you, Sonic. Th thank you, uh, Anthony. I I must say, one thing strikes me is I'm into public service. I believe the government is us and we are the government. And we need to do public service in one way or the other and to keep the country in the right place. And um, your unit, your work that you do is, is very, at least to me as an observer, stimulating and important. And, um, and you, you represent not only the country, not only the Air Force, but you represent your clientele commands. You, you are giving, giving benefit in all directions, and thank you for doing that. Thanks for the kind words. Thanks for having us today. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah.
Thanks, Thanks, for, giving us, Thanks for giving us this platform, Jay. I really appreciate it. Obviously, Great. we're passionate about America uh, and about innovation. And those two yeah. things are perfect to work for a little yeah. sparking fun. You could have fooled me. Yeah. <laughs> Aloha.